How's everyone doing? Got a really cool lecture today. All right. So welcome to uh, Computer Science 4300 lecture number nine. We are getting in there. Wow. It's already like the second week of October. Where's the term going? It's crazy. All right. So today we're going to be talking about something really important, um, especially for assignment three, but in games in general. We're going to be talking about uh, sprites, textures, and animations, and how we're going to create those things and load those things and store them and access them and compute them in our game engine. And it's going to be uh, super interesting. So just as a, a review of where we are so far, last time we talked about collision detection and resolution. Now we're going to be talking about sprites, textures, and animation. Uh, coming Tuesday is actually midterm break, so we do not have a lecture. I may actually still stream during that time. It won't be uh, like a regular class lecture, but I may be doing some programming or something like that. So um, if you're bored on that Tuesday, feel free to tune in, but there, there won't be an official class that you have to attend. And then on Thursday, we're going to talk about... Uh, game event system that we're going to be doing, which was not in the last offering of this course, but I've come up with this recently. So we're going to talk about how we handle events and and pass actions through our, through our game engine. So that'll be really interesting. And then after that, we'll have everything that we need to know for assignment three. So on the 20th, we'll be giving out um, assignment three. And that is when assignment two is due as well. Cool. So let's just get into it then. Someone in the chat says, can this help me make a PS5 game? <clears throat> well, the answer to that is not 100% no, but uh, certainly a lot of things going on in a PS5 game that we're not covering. So for those of you who may be just uh, finding us on, on Twitch here, uh, you can type exclamation point course to figure out more about this course, and you can type exclamation point playlist to get all the YouTube videos um, from the course. And so we're making a, a 2D game engine in this course, so not, not a 3D game engine. So let's get into the PowerPoint slides. All right, one, excuse me, let's turn off my Michael Icon. All right. So I just had a question that I want to answer first. So let's see what this is saying. Assignment three or assignment two. Um, yeah, so here it says it's due on the 15th. But this says it's due on the 20th. You know what? There's no, uh, thank you for bringing that up. There's no reason to have that do so early. So why not? We'll just change that. So extra time to work on assignment two because we'll just have it do um, when assignment three is given out. Okay, so an extra five days for assignment two. You can all thank Taswaf for bringing that up. So basically what I'm doing in this course is the same day that an assignment is due, another one is given out. So there's at no point are you not doing work, right? So the only thing I don't want to happen is have two assignments being worked on at the same time, right? So here, um, what happened was I originally was going to give out assignment three right here when I made up the schedule over here. But then what happened was I put in this extra lecture. And by putting in that extra lecture, I forgot to update it over here because I have to manually update that. Okay. So that's good. You've got an extra five days for the assignment. I'll make sure and announce that on D2L. So let's get back into the PowerPoint. This, this is a cool lecture. I really like this lecture. So today we're going to be talking about um, SFML textures and sprites and how we're going to use them, as well as basic texture-based animations and how we're going to use those in assignment three and going forward. And we're also going to be talking a lot about our engine architecture upgrades. So remember how I said that 
Every assignment, we're going to make improvements to our game engine that we've been writing. Well, this is going to be the single biggest jump, okay? So now that we have all the basics out of the way in this course, like the C++, the SFML, what ECS is, we're going to be we're going to start making some really big jumps. Um, so assignment three, uh, I may actually give some more time for assignment three as well. Excuse me, because assignment three is is probably going to be the hardest assignment. So we'll see how how um, when I release assignment three, I'll update to do I'll update the due date for that one as well. Okay. So, here's what we've seen so far. So this was the architecture that we used for Assignment 2. In Assignment 2, we had a game class, we had an entity manager class, we had an entity, we had a vec2, and we had some components, right? So the hierarchy of this system was that um, the game class kind of did everything for us, right? So the game class had the window, so that's what we rendered to. It had the entity manager, that's what handled all the entities, that's this class over here. It had a, a pointer to the player, and it had all the systems in it as well. So the game class was really the main class that did 90% of the work in this, in this uh, assignment too. Um, the entity manager, uh, that is the factory that produces and holds all, our, all, all of our entities. And then the entity class had um, individual variables for all of our different components, okay? And then a few functions for like destroying and, and um, tagging entities. But here's the important part that we're going to change for assignment three. Um, actually, we'll probably talk about this in a couple of lectures, but we're going to end up changing the entity class a little bit as well. All right, so the entity manager, just as, just as a recap, it's the entity factory class um, since the entity has a private constructor, um, only the entity manager can actually construct entities. So we can't accidentally construct entities outside of this factory. We implemented a delayed entity add functionality and delayed entity delete functionality to avoid things like iterator invalidation. And it also stores a secondary map from tags to entity vectors so that we can trade a little bit of storage for convenience at runtime. And it does some other bookkeeping things like memory management, etc. What the game class was, it's a top level game object that holds all the game data. It holds all the system functions, all the gameplay code. Okay, so that was what our game function did, or our game class. Now, what could this game engine do? Like, what could we actually do with that game engine? Well, we can create game objects as entity instances, right? So we can call the entity manager and say, give us a new entity or delete this entity. We could add component data to the entities. So we could say, you know, give this one a lifespan or make this one move around or whatever. We could implement our gameplay via systems and we could also handle user input. We could pause and play or exit the game. And we could initialize the game from a configuration file, right? So already in assignment two, we had a pretty powerful little game engine going for us. But this game engine had some limitations as well. The biggest limitation is that we could only display one scene, okay? And we'll talk about what a scene is in a second. We couldn't load any texture or sound assets. We couldn't display any textured animations to the screen and it doesn't have any sort of menu or interface, right? So these are the things that we're going to be adding for assignment three. We're going to be doing some architecture changes that allow us to, to do all of these things for assignment three. So what is a scene? So I know I've talked about this before, but I just want to have all this sort of, sort of self-contained in this lecture as well. So a game can contain many different scenes that have different logic and controls, right? So for example, in an RPG game, maybe we have different scenes like the following. So we'll have like a menu or text or dialogue scene, okay? So up here, we're talking to somebody, we're in a dialogue or we're in a menu, etc. We could have a world map scene. Sorry, these are supposed to be scenes. Let me change this. Scene. We're doing it live. 
Okay. So we could have a world map scene. And of course, in many JRPG style games, the world map is just where you're walking around interacting with the world. So you can go into buildings, you can like find enemies, stuff like that. And then maybe when a battle happens, we're actually in the battle scene or the combat scene, right? So here, uh, like a Pokemon game or other RPGs have these three main scenes. We could also be in like a video cut scene or something like that. But this is what a scene is, right? In each of these scenes, there are vastly different controls and game mechanics. So for example, up here in the dialogue scene, our controls might be limit, very, very limited to just say, moving up in the menu, moving down in the menu and selecting an option. Here in the, um, the world map scene, maybe, you know, our up, down, left and right let us move around, but we can't like use items or anything like that. In the combat scene, um, we maybe we can no longer move around, but we could say do attacks and use items. So you can see how each of these is going to probably have different systems, right? They're going to have different entities. They're going to have different things relating to them. And so how can our, how can we change our game engine architecture to allow for different game scenes? So let's look back once just, just briefly at the game class that we had in assignment two. So the game class for assignment two ha handled all the functionality for our game, right? Because our game was very simple. You start the game, you're playing the Geometry Wars, and that's the entire game. There's never any other scene in the game, right? There's no menus, there's no like cinematics, there's no like other scenes. It's just that one scene. So the game class could handle everything for that. So some of the functionality will remain the same, over all game scenes, right? So when we go back here, some of our game engine functionality is still the same despite the scenes being so different. So what is the same here? So we've still got the same main loop structure. We've still got the game window. We've still got the config file and we may have like all of our assets loaded, okay? So we're gonna identify parts of the architecture that are gonna be the same throughout all different scenes and we're going to do something with that. But some of this functionality will be specific to this type of scene that's currently shown, right? So the input controls may vary from scene to scene. How it's rendered could vary from scene to scene. The game logic, the collisions, et cetera, et cetera. That, those, could always, those could be different from scene to scene. And so we'll want some sort of way of separating um, the different functionality between the different type of logical scenes. All right, so here's what we're going to do. In assignment three, we're going to take that game class that did everything for us in assignment two, and we're going to break it up into two different classes. So let's separate the previous game class into two classes, which will handle all this new functionality. So the first class is going to be the game engine class. So this will handle the functionality that's present in all of the scenes. It's also going to handle the construction and the data management of the scene objects. And it's also going to handle the game's main loop and the quitting of the game. Okay. It's also going to do input handling and we'll look at that in the, in the next lecture. The scene class then is going to handle the functionality that's specific to that scene. And we're also going to have an entity manager per scene. So it'll only handle the entities that are relevant to that scene. So let's take a little bit of a deeper dive into this now. So over here, we're going to have a look at what is actually present in our game engine. And I know that my, um, my camera up here is covering uh, this area, but this, it's only covering the word game engine. Okay. So this is the game engine class. Inside the game engine class, uh, I'll discuss all of these functions once I'm done with the slide. So the game engine class is going to store the top level game data. So the stuff that always has to be present no matter what scene that we're in. So it's going to store the assets. So these could be things like textures, sounds, whatever. It's going to store the window. So the actual game window that we're drawing to. Of course, we need to have a window to play the game. Um, and it's going to store all the different scene data as well. It's also going to perform the top level functionality that's based on this data. So for example, it's going to handle how we actually change the scenes, 
right? So the code to change the scenes is going to be the game engine class. We're also going to be handling the physical keyboard and mouse input in the game engine class itself. The run function in the game engine class is going to contain the game's main loop, which we had just in a while loop before in the game class. And the game engine, there's only going to be one instance of the game engine running, and the pointer to this game engine class will be passed to the scenes in their constructor, okay? So for example, inside our different scenes, we're going to have a pointer to the game engine class, and in that way we can call the game engine class in order to get, ass uh, get access to things like the assets, the window, and the scenes, okay? And I'll show how we do that in the future. Next, we're going to have the scene base class. So we're going to use some, some object object oriented programming here. So we're going to have some inheritance. So we're going to have a scene base class and then we're going to have um, multiple derived scene classes, one for each type of scene that we have. So the scene base class is going to be, um, let me just move my camera over for a sec. Okay, so you can see here that the scene is an abstract class. There's no real good place for me to put my camera here. Maybe up in the top left. No, okay, I'm going to keep it here. So it's an abstract class. That's just what I wanted to show. So an abstract class, if you're not familiar with that, it just means that the scene base class cannot directly be instantiated. We can only instantiate derived classes from the scene base class. So the scene base class is going to store common scene data. Right? So, proper object-oriented programming, um, if we have a base class, we want to store in the base class things that will be commonly present in all possible derived classes, right? So every type of scene will have, for example, um, an entity manager. Every scene will have a frame count, so what current frame of this scene is it? It's going to have certain actions that can be performed, right? So it's going, the, the scene base class as its internal variables are going to store um, these variables. The scene specific functionality is going to be carried out in the derived class and we'll talk about that in a little bit. So the base scene class is abstract, which means it can't be instantiated. We have to instantiate the derived classes. And the simulate function is going to call the derived scenes update function a given number of times. So let me let me go back to the game engine and talk about all the different variables that we're going to have inside the game engine, okay? So first, we're going to have the scenes, and I'll talk about that in a bit, but the scenes are going to be stored in a map, and we're going to map strings to scenes. And you can essentially think of the string here as the scene name, and we're also going to store a string in the class, which is the current scene. So for example, if I've got a, a menu scene and a gameplay scene, and I say that the current scene is equal to the menu scene, then it will draw the menu scene as the current scene. It's also going to store the window. It's also going to store a variable which stores all the assets. So we'll talk about this a bit later, but we're going to have a class called assets that will store all the assets. And we're also going to have a boolean which says whether or not the game is currently running. And if it's not running for some reason, we'll exit. Um, it's going to have an init function. So that init function will do things like load all the assets. It's going to have a current scene function. So the current scene function is going to look up the string of the current scene in the scene map and then return us the current scene. And we'll get to that once, once we start talking about it. The run function... Um, we'll run the entire game. So we'll, we'll create a game engine object and then we'll just call run and that will be the main loop. The update function is going to happen once every game frame and we're going to call that function. Quit is pretty obvious. We're going to have a change scene function that will allow us to change the current scene to another scene. And we're also going to have uh, getter functions for the assets and the window so that our scenes can actually get, you know, hey, give me the window, I want to be able to draw to this thing. And the game engine class is also going to have the user input system. So that's the, that's the things that are going to live in the game engine. And I know that this is a lot to digest right now, but it'll be pretty obvious why this is once you start using it. And you'll say, oh, wow, that's, that's pretty cool that we've separated it this way. 
The scene base class, as we said, it's going to store this data which is common to every scene. So when we're designing this class, we look at the scenes and we say, okay, what is going to be in every single scene? Well, we're going to need a pointer back to the game engine, right? So we can access, access the game assets and the, the window and stuff like that. Every scene is going to have its own entity manager. It's also going to have its own current frame count, so a frame count within the scene. We're also going to have an action map, and we'll talk about that next lecture. But what this action map is going to do is it's going to let us map keyboard input to different actions, okay? So we'll be able to do things like remap keys and all sorts of cool stuff. It's also going to store whether or not the current scene is paused or if it's ended and things like this. We're going to have um, also some abstract functions, okay? So these abstract functions in C++, if we say, if we declare a function is equal to zero, it means that it's abstract. And so what that means is if there's an abstract function, then that's not implemented by the base class. And so hopefully you've all learned this in your object-oriented programming class. And so we absolutely have to, in all of our derived scene classes, implement these three functions, okay? So each derived scene class has to have an update function, and that updates our game engine for one game tick. It has to have a do action system, which when passed in an action, does that action. And actions are going to be things like jump, move left, move right, etc. And each derived scene also has to have a render system. So these are the only three things that every scene has to have, right? So if you think about like a menu system and a gameplay system, they both have to render to the screen. They both have to be able to do actions like move up, move down in the menu, move up, move down in the, in the game. And they each have to have an update function. So those are our three abstract functions that every derived um, scene class has to have. And then the base scene class also has some other functionality, um, which we'll get into uh, once, we, uh, once we do the next lecture. Okay. So now we talk about the derived classes. Okay. So the derived scene classes are going to store their scene-specific data. So if we think about this, so for example, in assignment three, when we're playing a Mario level, um, the, the playing level scene will store the data that is specific to that scene. For example, we might have uh, a level data. So, okay, where are all the tiles stored in this level? We may have a player pointer that we're talking about. So, for example, some, some scenes may not actually have a player in them. So, for example, the menu might not have a player, but this one does. We may have some config that's specific to certain things in this scene. In assignment three, for example, we'll have a player config that does things like define the player sprite. Um, also, we have the player uh, jump height. We have the movement speeds, etc. So all that is specific um, to this scene play. Oh yeah, I forgot to say this. Um, camera. All right. So this is the, the, the scene play that we're talking about. And so in assignment three, we're going to have two scenes. One scene is the menu scene, and one scene is the play scene. So for those who are unfamiliar, let me actually just, uh, I'll just go show this, actually, so it'll be obvious. Okay, uh, bin. So here's the assignment three solution being run. And what we see here is that when the game starts, we're in the menu scene. The menu scene has certain controls, so we can move up and down in the menu. We can wrap around. We can hit escape to close the game, or we can hit the D key to play the game. So depending on which level we have chosen, when we hit the key to play the game to get into a level, then that switches the scene to another scene. So now in this scene, which is the scene play scene, it's the derived the derived scene of the scene pace class, all of our systems relating to the actual gameplay will be present. Versus when we're in the menu scene, the scene menu class will just have the systems that are specific to the menu. So if you want to 
think about the different possible ways we could do something like this. Yes, if we really wanted to, we don't have to have this nice architecture of separating game engine functionality from scene functionality. We could use the architecture from assignment 2, but then basically what we would have is like a, a bunch of if statements saying if we're currently at the menu then do this stuff, if we're currently in the game do this stuff, and so that just gets really messy and we want to separate that functionality into classes. We want to use good object-oriented programming. So here for example, in this scene, we would hold the player data, we would hold the level data, so for example where all the tiles are supposed to be. Um, the player specific stuff like, you know, how fast can they run, um, etc. So, so that's what, what the separation of the scenes actually is. So let's get back to the PowerPoint. Okay. So some scene-derived classes may require different systems based on the functionality. So for example, in uh, the scene play scene, we're going to need a bunch of different systems for assignment 3. We're going to need an animation system, a movement system. Uh, oh, we actually don't have an enemy spawner system. I, can, I need to remove that. Uh, a collision system a rendering system, a do action system, and possibly a debug system. And remember that because the base class scene is abstract and it has these three functions as abstract, the update function, the render function, and the do action function must be implemented for each derived class. Everything else is optional. Okay. So now let's talk about scene switching. If we look back here at the game engine class, this is what I showed before, the game engine class stores a map from strings to shared pointers. Okay, So for example, in that map, we could have uh, an entry which is indexed by menu, and then the value for that um, key value pair will be the scene, which is the menu scene. Maybe we have another one which is like play. Actually, let, let me just draw this out for you. Uh, so give me a second here. I gotta bring up my blackboard. I wasn't prepared. The blackboard takes a little bit of time to boot. Here we go. We got the blackboard. Okay. So this is the map. So inside game engine, let me change this to white. Inside game engine, we're going to have a standard map from standard string to standard shared pointer scene. Okay, and this is going to be called M scenes. Now I just need to drag this over. Ah. All right, so our game engine is going to store this map. And if we look at kind of how this map is, is indexed, well, over here, we can view this as sort of the keys, right? So if I have a menu key in my map, and uh, let me make that a bit bigger. So here's my keys. So over here, I might have a, a menu, right? Menu string. Over here, I might have a, uh, a play string. And what these are going to point to is over here, this is going to be the menu scene object, and this is going to be the play scene object, right? So if I want to switch the scene, I can say, okay, switch the scene to the menu scene, and then it will be loading this scene as the current scene to be playing. And here, um, if I want to switch to the play scene, then it's going to be displaying this play scene. So Inside the game engine class, we're also going to have um, a standard string m current scene. And so whenever we want to display the current scene, all we have to do is load the scene from the map, which is indexed by this string. Okay? So you see how that works? We've got a bunch of different scenes, and they're indexed by some string or a title. And we can say, at any point, switch to the menu scene. 
or switch to the game playing scene or overwrite the game playing scene with a new scene or something like that. And in that way, we can store an arbitrary number of scene objects and we can index them by some intuitive string. All right, so we'll go back to the PowerPoint. So the game engine class also stores this current scene string. So what happens is the current scene function looks up the currently active scene by taking our map indexed by the current scene string. And so that's how it's that how it that's how it knows which scene is the current scene that we're looking at. And so our change scene function is going to take in a string and a scene and it's going to change the scene to a new or previously stored scene based on this key. And this will be really obvious once you start using it. And so what this is doing is it mimics a finite state machine. So if you've heard of a finite state machine in the chat, let me know. Hopefully you have in your second year of CompSci. And so again, a, a finite state machine works something like this. Let's go back to our Blackboard. So we're here at the Blackboard. And let's take these circles to be our scenes. Okay. So here we might have the menu scene and we might have the play scene. And so this is a finite state machine where the states are scenes and the actions or transitions between the scenes are defined in the behavior somehow. So let's say in the menu, I'm going to uh, click something, right? I'm going to click the menu and what's going to happen on click is we're going to start playing the game. And when we're playing the game, if we hit the escape key, then we're going to transition back to the menu. So this, what we can do here is we can actually have, and, and what I'm going to get you to do for the project, there will be a write-up on the project, is you're going to have to draw the finite state machine of the state transitions or the scene transitions in your game. And by doing this, like this view of your game and the transitions back and forth, it will actually really help you when you go to program it. Because once you design it, then everyone's on the same page and you can't screw up. All right, so let's get back to the PowerPoint. So we're mimicking a finite state machine with this mapping, um, with this map that we're doing. So let's look at a more concrete example of how we do the scene switching then. So when the game engine is constructed, the initialization function is called. And the first thing it's going to happen is going to load the assets, whatever. But it's going to, before we actually start playing the game, it's going to set an initial scene. So it's going to change the scene and the function is going to be called with menu as the scene string and a shared pointer to a scene menu object, right? So again, our map is storing base class scene pointers, but we can, of course, if you know object oriented programming, we can store a derived class inside the base class pointer. So this data structure can, can store any type of scene indexed by a string. So inside this function, it will change the current scene equal to the string that we passed in. So now the game engine thinks that the current scene is the menu. And then inside our scenes map, we're going to access it via this string. And we're going to set that equal to a new shared pointer to a menu scene. So that's how that works. Now, the player is then presented with the menu screen. And then if a player selects an option on the menu, then what we can do is, for example, set some string equal to the level path. So the level path is the currently selected menu item. Then what's, what's, happening, what's going to happen is the scene menu class in its action handling is going to say, hey, we want the game to start. So it's going to call the game object right, the game engine object and say, change the scene to playing and pass in a new shared pointer to a scene play with the level path as the constructor. So that's how it works. We're going to be able to tell the game engine to switch the scenes inside various scenes. Okay. I keep saying okay all the time. Uh, all right. I'll switch to all right. 
So there we go. That's how we do the scene switching. So we have a game engine that stores all the scenes and we have access to change the scenes from anywhere that can see the game engine. Now let's switch gears and we'll talk about asset management. So I'm going to move my camera back over. So asset management is very, very, very important. But what is an asset? So an asset, when you're talking about game programming, assets are external files. And by external files, I mean files that are not code. Okay, so not part of your actual code. They are external files that are loaded into memory to be used in the game somehow. Why isn't this slide moving? All right, there we go. So for our games, we're going to have four types of assets. We're going to have textures. So textures are going to be defined in image files. Uh, so for example, PNG files, JPEG files, bitmap files. In for our assignments, we're going to be using just PNG files because PNG files can store transparency. And we're going to need that so that we don't have like really blocky textures like Mega Man walking through the the scene with a, a white background or something like that. Uh, so textures, we're going to be using image files and specifically PNG files. We're going to have animations and we'll talk about animations later in this lecture. So animations are going to be textures and some extra bookkeeping and we'll get into that. We're going to have sounds. So SFML by default can uh, load WAV files and OGG files. This is an open source um, format. SFML cannot load MP3s because MP3s, the MPEG compression scheme is proprietary and so they didn't include it. So that's a little bit annoying because I know most, most people have their sounds stored in MP3 files, but you can get them as, you can just convert them. And we're going to have fonts as true type fonts, um, which are TTF files. And so fonts will be displayed to the screen um, or text will be to display be able to be displayed to the screen with any font that we load in our asset management. And the number one rule about assets is load once, use often. So for example, let's say we're playing Mario Brothers, right? And we, we might have a level that has a hundred different Goombas in it. So a hundred of the exact same sprite in the level. We do not want to, so for example, one way of doing this is that every time you load the level, each entity is going to load its texture from a file. And so what would happen in the case of the Goombas is now we would have loaded a hundred copies of the Goomba texture into memory. But that is not how we should do things. What we should do is load one copy of every texture or every sound or every animation, or every font, and then we can use a reference to that asset whenever we go to do something like draw it, for example. So we want to load assets once, and then use them often. That's, that's very important, and if you take anything out of this lecture, at least take that. Do not load a unique asset multiple, do not load the same asset multiple times. So how are we going to ensure that that can happen? All right, so we're going to create an assets class and the assets class is going to live in the game engine object and it's going to store all of our assets within some various data structures. So again, we're using like data encapsulation and modularity here to make sure that all the data of specific types like the entities live in the entity manager class and the assets are going to live in the assets class. So we want to load assets that are defined in an external configuration file because we're all about uh, data-oriented design in this course as well. So for example, we may want to do something like specify uh, a texture or a sound. And so in our assets file, and let me actually show you the assets file that we're going to use. So I can load this up. Where are we? Okay, so here we have the assets file from assignment three. And what we can see is we're going to have a specific format just like we did with the rectangles and the circles in assignment two. Uh, 
We're just using a plain old text file, right? You could use whatever you want for this, but I think plain old text is fine. Excuse me. So for assignment three, we're going to be able to load textures. We're going to be able to load animations and we're going to be able to load fonts. You can put sounds in there if you want as well. Oh, geez, excuse me. So for example here, we have a texture and this syntax means that we're going to name this texture tech stand. So tech is just short for texture. And this is the standing texture of Mega Man. And the next thing will be where that texture actually lives relative to our, our executable. So we're going to have an images folder. Inside that, we're going to have a Mega Man folder. And inside that, we're going to have the stand 64. So a standing um, animation that's 64 pixels high. So that was the config file. Oh, yeah, and I'll get back to animations and stuff later. Okay, back to the PowerPoint. So this is the syntax that we're going to be using. We're going to be defining the type of asset. We're going to be giving that asset a name, and then we're going to be pointing to where that asset lives on our disk. And then what we're going to be able to do is reference that, access, that asset via its name. So if we ever want to get access to like the texture for Mega Man or the sound for Mega Man's death, excuse me, we're going to be able to call the assets file and just say something like get texture or get sound. And so to implement this, the asset class is going to use some standard maps, like maps are our friends, and we're going to be mapping things from strings to asset types. I need to blow my nose. Give me one second while I do that. All right, we're back. I wanted to save you from that horror. Okay. So this is what the assets class is going to look like. The assets class lives inside the game engine class. Okay, my mic is on, right? Okay, good. It's going to live inside the game engine class so that we can have access to it from within our scenes. It's going to be initialized when the game engine init function is called. So what we are going to do in our game is that we're going to have when the game starts, the first thing that happens is we load all of our assets for all of our scenes. Um, so, this is accessed via the scenes pointer to the game engine class. So inside our scene, we're going to have this game variable. So that's the pointer to the game object. And then we're going to be able to access the assets object that lives there via the get assets. So that's pretty easy. The assets are loaded once at the beginning of the program. And then assets can be used in any scene at any time, but they're only initialized once in memory. Okay, so we only have one Goomba sprite loaded or one Goomba texture. We only have one brick texture loaded. So for example, if I go back to our uh, solution here, and if I'm playing the game, you can see here that there's like one, two, three, four, five. There's five brick textures on the screen. There's 20 or 30 of these ground textures on the screen. There's a bunch of these uh, question mark textures on the screen, right? But in memory, we have only loaded one copy of this texture. And then what we do is when we draw that, so the way SFML stores the textures, I'm not going to, this isn't a graphics class. I'm not going to get into it too deeply. But when SFML loads a texture, it loads that texture into video memory, and then it gives us an ax a pointer to that texture object, essentially, right? So we create the data once, and then we pass around a pointer to it internal with the, the SFML stuff does this internally. So a texture object stores a pointer to the data, so it's only loaded once, and then any sprite that uses that texture is just pointing to that single copy of the texture data which lives in, in memory. And then when it actually goes to draw it, it sends it to the GPU, um, for example. Okay, so that's what we mean 
uh, when we when we're talking about all this load once use many stuff. For larger games, so in this course, we're not making AAA games with gigabytes and gigabytes of, of data, right? But you can think that if you've ever played especially a console game where they have to load data from a disk or um, if they have to load it from like a slow hard drive, if, you, if you're transitioning from like one level to another level, there might be a loading scene. And so in order to save on RAM, in order, instead of loading gigabytes of data all at the start and then maybe minimizing loading screens, the company has determined that they're going to only load the assets that they need to load for that particular level or that particular scene one at a time. So if you, if you get to a new level or a new zone um, and you see a loading screen, Usually, those loading screens are associated with asset management and loading data off the disk. Okay, there's some computation going on there, but oftentimes it's just the amount of time that it takes to get that data into RAM so that you can start using it. Someone said, technically, when it's loaded via SF Texture, it's already on the GPU. So, yeah, so if you create an SF Texture object, which we're about to get into, once that object is created, there's a pointer to the texture in RAM, so it is still stored in your system's RAM, but it's also uploaded into the GPU's texture memory, and the underlying OpenGL code stores the index in the texture memory where that. Um, someone who's not in the course has, has asked me about this M underscore in the chat. M underscore is what we're using in this class to denote a private member variable. I think it's Hungarian notation, that's what they call it. I'm not 100% sure though. Um, so this is one of the naming conventions. Okay, so that's how assets are going to be handled. Now we're going to talk about textures and animations. Ooh. Excuse me. Textures and animations, how are we going to do this? Well, let's see. So a texture is a graphic, right? Some graphical data, so pixel colored data. And that graphic, when mapped to a shape, like a rectangle, for example, is a texture. So a texture could be generated dynamically, right? We could procedurally generate these textures if we wanted to, or we could load them from an existing image file. So for example, a bitmap file or a PNG file or a JPEG. A rectangular shape with a texture attached is typically called a sprite. Okay, so if we have uh, a rectangular shape with a texture attached, and that's what we want to draw in our game, um, we, we have something called a sprite. And sprites are very, very common in, in games and older computers actually had sprite hardware, so it had a special place in memory. Um, so for example, I think the Commodore 64 had eight dedicated sprite slots, and so it was actually like a 128 by 128 spot in memory where you could define like the pixel values that get drawn to the, sp to the screen. So again, rectangular entity plus texture equals sprite. And you can go to the graphics and sprite tutorial um, on the SFML website to learn all the details about this. So how do we do this in SFML? One of the reasons, and probably the main reason, that we're using SFML over other things like pure OpenGL is that SFML can read many common image formats for us right out of the box. And I can't tell you how many hours, dozens of hours I've spent in my life trying to load images into pure OpenGL. Oh my god. Like, determining the number of bits per pixel, whether or not there's an alpha channel, just loading it, maybe it's transposed, maybe it's not transposed. It's just a nightmare. So, this is not a graphics course, it's a game programming course, so we're using this library that does it all for us. So, it's super easy to load a texture in OpenGL, or sorry, in SFML, not in OpenGL. Uh, 
Um, so what we do, we create a texture object, and then we're going to call a function, which is load from file, and that takes in a relative path to an image. So for example, if we had an image called image.png in the same uh, directory as our executable, then we could try and load that into the texture by calling texture.load from file with the image link. Now this load from file function returns a boolean, and that boolean is true if it loaded successfully, and it's false if it didn't load successfully. So for example, one reason it could not load successfully is if the file didn't exist, or if you passed in the wrong file name or made a typo. Another reason maybe was because the data was in the wrong format, so maybe it was expecting a PNG file, but it got a, an MP3 file or something like that. And so if it doesn't load correctly, then you can use a statement like this that says if not this function, so again, this returns a boolean, if it's false, then if not that is true, so then you can go here and this will essentially be an error handling step, right? So here we could print, oh, we couldn't load the thing. We can also create a blank texture. So for example, if we want to just create a blank texture, um, we could say texture.create200200. So this would create an empty texture of size 200 by 200. We could also update the contents of a texture manually. So we have an, for example, if we have an array of pixels, um, so here we have a bunch of unsigned integers of eight bytes or eight bits. So we have unsigned bytes, those are our pixels. We create an integer or we create an array of those unsigned integers. And then we could update the texture from the raw pixels if we want to. So if we wanted to go through and procedurally, con uh, procedurally generate some textures, here's how we could do that in SFML. Our algorithm could work with the base underlying pixel array, and then you could set the value of a texture equal to that. SFML also has something called an image class, and so you could load an image, and then you could update the texture by passing in an image. So for example here, if we loaded some image, um, into an SF image object and we wanted to set that inside a texture we would just pass that variable name into the update function and we could also update the texture from the current contents of a window so if we have a render window we could actually draw the contents of that window to a texture and then the texture would have the contents of that window and this is actually one way that we could implement screenshot functionality in our game. And so for assignment four and for the project, you'll be doing, you'll have a, a function in there that could take a screenshot of your game. And it's really simple with SFML. Okay, now let's talk about the texture and the shape size. Sometimes the texture will not be the same size as the entity's shape. And I'll show an example of this. So what we can do is we can specify a sub rectangle of the texture, which will be the thing that gets drawn to the screen. Okay. So let's say we have a really big image here called image.png and we want to load in a 32 by 32 sub rectangle of that image starting at 10 pixels, 10 pixels from the top left. Here's the syntax to be able to do that. And I'll tell you why we might want to do that. Okay, I just talked about this, but for some reason I repeated it on this slide. So resizing the entity would be bad. Resizing the texture could be expensive. And so what we can do is we can specify a sub rectangle of the picture to be drawn. And so that the entire texture still is loaded into RAM and GPU memory, but we just draw a certain part of it, okay? So for example, um, here's one example of that, where we might have a texture which is very large and an entity which is smaller, and so we can specify a sub-rectangle of the texture to be drawn for the entity or the sprite, okay? Also, what we could do, and we're, we'll talk about this in a bit, is we are actually going to store our animations as a single texture. So a single image file will have every frame of our animation in it, and then we can specify which part of the texture should be drawn 
And as such, we can actually play an animation. So, we'll get back to that though. How do we create a sprite in SFML? Well, it's it couldn't be easier. You create a sprite object, and then you set the texture of the sprite based on a texture object. That's it. And then inside the main loop of our program, we just draw the sprite. Look at how easy this is. This is why we're using SFML. It's just so good. It's so easy. This would be about 50, 60 lines of code at the least in pure OpenGL. Okay. And similarly, um, what we can do is we can set a sub rectangle of the texture to be drawn just like we said. What does the sprite look like underneath? So for example, if we have a texture and we create a hundred different sprites based on that texture, is the texture being copied? No, it's not. So the sprite architecture is a very lightweight object. It consists of vertices, a texture pointer, and the rectangle, uh, rectangle of the texture to be drawn. So this is literally copied and pasted from the header file of the SFML sprite object. What it contains are four vertices, right? That's the vertices of the sprite. Of course, rectangle has four vertices. Um, it creates, it, it contains a pointer to the texture that's going to be drawn for this sprite. And it also contains a rectangle and that is the rectangle, the sub rectangle that we want to be drawn from the texture. Okay. And we'll, we'll see what this means in a little bit. So sprites store pointers to textures. All right. Since they store pointers to textures, we have to be very, very careful. This is one of the times where the manual memory management of C++ can really bite us in the ass. And if you're not super familiar with things like stack memory and heap, and heap memory and how things are allocated and deallocated, it might be very difficult for you to understand why this is bad. So we have a function here. Let's say we have a function and it's called load sprite. So what's going to happen is it's going to take in a string, which is the file name of the texture that the sprite should load. And then it's going to return a sprite object. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to load in a text. We're going to create a texture object and we're going to load the texture from a file. Okay. Now what I haven't said up to this point is that when a texture object that is stack allocated, remember when we talked about RAII? Resource allocation is initialization. So what's going to happen here in the constructor or in the load from file part, we're going to create the space for the texture. It's going to load the texture. But when this texture goes out of scope because it's stack allocated, so down here, once this line of code is, is read, the texture's internal pointer is going to be deleted. Okay, so in order to save memory, it's not creating memory leaks. It's cleaning up after himself. So if we return an SF sprite, alloc an SF sprite created with this texture, then what happens is this texture just stores a pointer to data. But when this function returns, that pointer is going to be deleted. And so when we return this sprite object and we try and draw it, I'm not sure if we'll get an error, but at the very least, we're going to get nothing drawn to the screen because the texture pointer, right? The internal contents of the texture pointer, that array that it stores are going to be deleted by the time this function returns. So go back to this and make sure you understand this because it's very, very important. We get around this completely in the way that we handle assets because our assets are living persistently in an asset manager class, right? So we have our assets class and we're storing the textures in a map and those textures are never going away. 
And so those textures, internal pointers will be valid until our, um, our program terminates. And so by using the assets class, we've avoided potential errors like this. But just be careful that this stuff can happen. Okay. Sprites can have colors set on them. And so you may ask, hmm, that's a bit strange. If I'm loading an image, why would I set why would I set a color, right? Like the Mario brick is brown, the Mega Man is blue. Why would I set a color on that? Well, here's one reason. The sprite set color, we could do this for example. So if we set the color of a sprite to green, if this right here, the original sprite was like white colored, if we set that sprite's color to green, it will overlay a green color on top of that. If we set it to gray or darker, then we would darken the sprite. And if we, for example, set that sprite's color to 1, or, or sorry, 255, 255, 255, so R RGB white, and we set its alpha channel to half, then that sprite would now be half transparent. So if you wanted to have a sprite and draw it in a transparent manner, then all you have to do is set the SF color of the sprite equal to half transparent white. And just to let you know, if you, by default, the color of a sprite is white, so if you set it to white, it's going to draw the default texture. It's not going to be whiter than it normally is. White is the default texture. Sprites and textures can also have their textures smoothed, okay? So for example, many times the image that you load your texture from will not be the same size that you actually draw the texture on the screen, right? So I could have a texture that's 128 by 128 pixels large, but my entity in the game that uses that texture might only be 64 by 64. And so the resizing algorithm that's used to, to translate the larger or smaller sized image into a different size, that can either be smooth or not smooth. Now, SFML hides the details from you here. These could, like in OpenGL, you can talk about like using nearest neighbor, or like a linear conversion or a bicubic conversion or a quadratic conversion or something like that. But here, essentially, it's just using two different options. If we set smooth to false, when we resize, we're going to get that sort of MS Paint resizing where we get um, uh, pixelated effects. So if it goes smaller, we're going to have um, this type of pixelated effect. And if it gets larger, then we're just going to be blowing up the pixels. Versus if we set smooth to true, then it's going to use an algorithm that upscales it just a little bit nicer, right? But on the other hand, if you want that 8-bit look, then you want smooth to false. But if you have textures that are nice and smooth, then when you upscale them, you might want to set it to smooth. All right. We can also repeat textures. So for example, if I have a texture, so if this is the texture that I load from file, right? And it's this big. And if I create an entity that's this big and set this texture, right? So I'm going to set the texture of this to this entity. If I set repeated to false, it's going to draw one big upscaled circle. If I set repeated to true, then what it's going to do is it's going to tile these textures throughout the entity like this. So just keep that in mind. So for example, if you wanted to draw a background with a repeated texture, you wouldn't have to draw it multiple times. You could just draw one big uh, sprite with the texture repeated. So that's just one, one good thing you can do here. Some sprite transformations that we can have. Um, we can set the position of a sprite. We can move the sprite. We can rotate the sprite. We can scale the sprite, etc., etc. So scaling would make it bigger or smaller. Um, yeah. All right. Texture sheets. Who've heard, who out there in the chat has heard of a texture sheet before? Okay, we've got a few people. Awesome. 
So what's a texture sheet? So games can have many, many textures that will be used. And sometimes it could be hard to manage those files, right? So texture sheets can be used that store many textures with one image. And it's actually a really easy way to organize and store textures. And if the entire sheet is loaded into graphics memory, then less texture swapping actually occurs. So if you really want to be hardcore with your graphics memory management, you would load one big texture sheet into memory. And instead of having multiple textures loaded that the GPU has to swap between, you'd have one big texture sheet and you'd just be telling it to draw specific subparts of that texture. So for example, here's the texture sheet. Can anyone name this game? while I take more drink because my throat is killing me. Please tell me someone out there can name this game. All right, perfect, Link to the Past. So this is a texture sheet for Link to the Past. This is not exactly how it's stored in, this, in the SNES, but we could picture in our game, yeah, it's Doom, that if we load this whole texture sheet into memory, we could just tell it, I want to draw this specific texture, or I want to draw this specific texture, right? Just by specifying the rectangle within this sheet. Similarly, we could have like all the tiles for the background of our game and the ground of our game loaded into a texture sheet like this. So instead of loading a different texture for every character, pose, or tile, you just figure out which sub rectangle is to be drawn. And then those rectangles could be stored as variables or they can be computed dynamically if we um, construct the sheet very cleverly. Um, so for example, the, the walking texture, we could identify that by being at a certain left top width and height value. Texture-based animations. So now that we've seen the idea of sprite sheets, how are we actually going to use those in our engine? So texture-based animations for our game, and so this is not the only way to implement animations. Like if you make a 3D game, 3D game animations are not texture-based animations. They are like pose-based, skeleton-based animations, okay? Some of those animations can be pre-computed, like the orc in World of Warcraft always runs the exact same way. Or you could have like ragdoll physics so that it's the, the animations are computed on the fly. But those are not loaded just from a texture, right? 2D animations can be loaded from a texture. So that's what we're going to do in this course. We're going to do it all from scratch. So animation in this case is a sequence of images that when played very quickly appears as motion. So texture animation can be achieved by quickly displaying different textures or different parts of the same texture. So bitmapped animation is also called raster animation. The reason it's called that is because it's made of pixels rather than vectors, right? So if we had like ragdoll physics, we would be storing our poses as vectors and then updating the position of our model. And that would be like a vector based animation versus this, which is a raster based animation or a bitmap animation. So how are we going to actually implement this? All right. So in our assignment, what we're going to do is I'm not going to have a single texture sheet for everything, okay? I'm going to have one texture sheet per animation, just to keep it simple so that the, the implementation of things is easier for you all. So what we're gonna do is this is an example of Mega Man running. Now, the actual animation that we have in our, in our assignment has four frames. There's a duplicate of, of this middle frame on the end, but three just looked so much nicer for the slide, so I kept it as three. So, here we're going to store a single texture. So this is going to be a single image in our, in our game assets file. Uh, that image is going to have a specific width, right? So there's a given width and there's a given texture height. Somehow, we have to be told, as the game engine, that this image has three frames of animation, okay? So what we're gonna do in our 
assets file is we're going to have a specification for specifying animations. And animations are going to be defined as animation, animation name, texture name, and then how many frames of animation are in that texture. So in our config file, we have to actually say, okay, load this image, and there are three frames of animation in this image. So if we want to figure out the frame width of one of our frames of animation, then that's really easy because it's the total width of the texture divided by the number of frames of animation. And in our case, because all of our images, like we've defined this in our assignment as one dimensional, well, it's every image is two dimensional, but what I mean is it's not a two dimensional sprite sheet, okay? Our animations just have frame, 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 right after each other from left to right. Uh, because of that, our animation height is always going to be the height of our texture. So we never have to change the animation height. Someone just asked in the chat, so are the pixels around Mega Man white and completely transparent? So someone um, just answered that in the chat and said, I think it's PNG, so it's transparent by default around him. That is correct. So our PNG files, PNG is used because it can store transparency. And so what you see here within this box is actually transparent background, but because it's displayed on a white slide, you're seeing it as white. Okay, but this is good because in our game, no matter what Mega Man is running in front of, you'll see the background behind him. You won't see like a white block behind Mega Man as he's running. So what we have to do for our animation is we have to specify which rectangle or which sub rectangle of this texture that we want to draw. And that rectangle is defined by four variables, the left side, so that's the x value, the top, so that's the top left x and y value, the width of the rectangle, and the height of the rectangle. So if we want to train, like if we want to actually put this into an example for our course, then the, the x value of the start of the sub rectangle is going to be the current frame times the frame width and remember, frame width is equal to the texture width, width divided by the number of frames. So the current frame divided by frame width is the x value. The y value is always going to be zero because it's always going to start at the top of the texture. And then we're going to have the frame width as the width of the frame and the frame height as the height of the frame. Okay, so let's do an example of this and we'll step through these three animations. So for frame zero, we're counting from zero because we're computer scientists, right? So frame zero is going to be the frame, which is zero, times the frame width, so all this is zero. Zero for our, for our y value, frame width and frame height. So what we get is the first frame of animation starts at zero, zero, and it has frame width and frame height as its dimensions. So this would be the first frame of our animation. Frame one is going to be one times frame width, zero FWFH. So here, frame width is the X value of the start. So at coordinate frame width zero is right here, and it's going to be frame width and frame height. That's the sub rectangle that we want to draw. And then frame two is two times frame width, zero frame width, frame height. So we can see how that pushes it every frame forward by the frame width and we still draw the same dimensions, okay? So we step through frame zero, frame one, frame two, and we do this in a cycle. And when we go to draw that sprite every so often, then that's how it'll, it'll work. Um, just one second. Yeah, I, I talked about this last time. Um, yeah, I, I literally talked about this last time and I repeated the slides for here some for some reason. So I'll just skip through this because we talked about it already. Okay, so the implementation of the animation itself. Actually, let me remove these from the slides because then I'll just be a bit confusing. So yeah, we don't need to talk about bounding box sizes here. So I just removed that from this set of slides. 
So now that we know the math behind computing what we want to draw for our animations, how are we going to actually implement that for our game engine? Okay. Now again, there's a million different ways that this could be implemented, but we're just going to do it in this specific way that I think makes it quite easy to understand. So we're actually going to implement an animation class because as you saw before, there's several variables involved with computing like what frame of animation we need to draw. So in order to really make that easy for us, we're going to implement a class called animation. And this is going to store all the variables that are related to an animation. And it's going to have a function on it called update, which provides the logic to process the animation. And then the C animation component is going to store the animation. So this is kind of the one exception to the rule for our ECS in this course. It's a very slight departure from the only pure data in component, but it's actually very helpful overall. And the reason we've done it this way is because animations are going to work the same no matter what scene they're in, right? We're always going to have this moving from one frame to another. It's a completely compartmentalized, like doesn't have any horizontal communication. And so the animation class is going to have the logic of animations stored in it. And then that animation class is going to be stored in a component. So at the very beginning of the course, I said that components are going to be pure data no matter what. This is the only exception. And we could, we absolutely could have component data just relating to animation class stuff and, and put the logic in one of our scene systems. But the problem there is that that system has to be called, like the animation update might be called in multiple scenes and we don't want to code duplicate all that. So here's kind of the balance where we're going to store an animation class inside a component and we're going to call that animation class's update function, which will do a little, little bit of logic for us. So what are the variables we need? Well, we're going to need a frame count and a current frame. We're going to need a size of the animation, right? And this is the size of the animation is going to be the width and the height of the animation frame. So that was FW. And that's going to be equal to our texture width divided by the frame count and our texture height. And we're also going to have a variable called animation speed. Because of course, if we just change the frame of animation on every frame of gameplay, this stuff is going to go past by so fast you won't even realize it or it'll, it'll just look really weird. And I'll show an example of that in a second. So each update, here's the math that you're going to have to implement in the animation class for assignment three. So we're going to increase the current frame counter. So the current frame counter inside the animation class is how many frames that this animation has been running for. And that's game frames, not animation frames, okay? Then we're going to say frame is equal to current frame divided by speed. And so what happens there is, let's say we want to update our frame um, every 10 frames, for example. And so we're going to compute this index lookup. So this is the frame. Uh, and I'll show an example of this in, in the blackboard after this. So frame is equal to current frame divided by speed mod frame count. Okay. What the hell does that mean? Let me just, let me show you. Okay. Let's say we have our three frames of animation here. And let's say our current frame is equal to, um, 20 right? Actually, let's say it's equal to 200. So I'll get you guys to do some math for me. So if this animation has been running for 200 frames, which frame rectangle of the original texture should we actually be showing? That's what this function does. So it's going to update the current frame. It's now at 200. And then this is going to be the frame of animation, meaning 
which of these cells should we be drawing? That's what this frame means, okay? So, current frame is equal to 200. Speed, let's say what we're doing is every 10 frames, we want to play the next cell. So that's the speed. So what speed, what the speed variable does is it says, how many frames of animation do we wait, or sorry, how many frames of the game do we wait before we transition to the next frame of animation, okay? So let's say that's 10. So if I have current frame of 200 divided by a speed of 10, then I should be playing the 20th frame of animation, right? But we only have three frames of animation. So in order to index the 20th frame of animation into these three frames of animation, we use the modulus operator. And what it does is it gets the remainder when you do 20 divided by three, okay? So this would be zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. So at the 200th game frame, we should be drawing this frame of animation. So that's what this calculation does for us. Now, now that we have that frame, which is equal to two, right? Zero, one, two. That two gets multiplied by the frame width and now we have the X component of the top left corner of the frame of animation. So this is two times frame width, zero, and the frame width and the frame height. And now that we have our rectangle, we just say, hey, Mr. Sprite, or Mrs. Sprite, um, set the textured rectangle equal to the rectangle that we just computed. And that's how we tell SFML which frame of animation that we should play. Perfect. And we're going to make an animation class for that. And here's the animation class. This is exactly what you'll get in the assignment. So we have um, the sprite. So the sprite is the thing that's going to store the pointer to the texture and the thing that's going to be drawn to the screen. We're going to have the frame count, the current frame, the speed, and the size. Actually, if you think about it, speed is actually the reverse of what it should be because the lower the speed variable, the faster our animation. So this is kind of reverse speed. And we might give our animation a, a name as well. There's constructor on the animation. So it's going to set up these variables for us and pass in the texture, etc. And so the internal sprite variable is going to be loading this texture, um, the, the constructing itself based on this texture input and a frame count and a speed. Then we're going to have a few helper functions on the animation class. So it's going to have this update function, which is called on every game frame in order to update the animation. It's going to have a function which says whether or not the animation has, um, has finished playing, right? Because for example, in our game engine, we're going to have some cases where we want the animation and we want the sprite, or sorry, we want the entity to play an animation on a loop versus sometimes we actually want the animation to play once and then the entity to be destroyed. For example, if we kill a brick and we get the explosion animation, it makes no sense to loop the explosion animation, right? We wanna play the explosion animation and then clean up the entity. And so we'll be able to do that. We can get the name, we can get the size, and we can get the sprite so that we can draw them to the screen. So for example, in our assignment, we're actually going to have Mega Man's run animation is going to be four, um, four frames of animation. It's going to be detailed in the assets file. And in the example assignment three run animation, so two lines of code are related to the animation. The first one is the loading of the texture. So we're gonna say texture, we're gonna give the texture a name, so tech run then this is the image file which loads the texture. And this down here, the entire thing is the texture. The next line that appears somewhere in the configuration file um, is we say animation run. So the run animation, this is the name of the animation. And it's going to use the text, the tech run texture. 
it's going to have four frames of animation and we're going to transition once every 10 frames. And let me show you how that works in a second. The only stipulation here is that just to keep things simple in our configuration file, the animations have to be defined in the anim they have to come in the file after we've loaded the texture, right? Because if we said animation run tech run before we define tech run, that when it went to parse it, it would say, hey, we don't have this texture. We could make multiple passes, but you know, let's just keep it simple and say that animations have to be defined after textures. So this <laughs> is going to be the architecture for assignment three. There's gonna be one other thing, actions, that we haven't talked about yet, but we're talking about those next, actions and events are the next lecture. But you can see how fast we've jumped from a single main file in the first assignment to a couple of classes in assignment two. And now all of a sudden we have like a huge game engine, but you can see how intuitive it is, right? You know exactly what each of these things is doing. If you want to do things like modify how the assets are loaded, you don't need to go through a million lines of code. You know that that's right here in the assets class. Um, you know that anything that has to do with, mod with animations is in the animation class. If you want to add new physics, you put it in the physics namespace, okay? And so all of that stuff, um, it, it's, it's a lot of stuff. It's, it's complex, but not complicated. That's what I like to say. So let's really quickly go back to the solution. So here you saw, you can see how fast that Mega Man is actually updating the animation. And I know that's a little bit small, but let's just have a look at that, right? Okay, so that's, that's like pretty much NES Mega Man running speed from what I can tell. If we go into the assets configuration file, down to the animation, run, there's still going to be four of these, but let's say now that we update the frame uh, of animation once every hundred game frames and we run it again. So what we'll see now is that a hundred game frames is about a second and a half. So once every second and a half, our animation is being updated. But you can see how cool that is now because the game designers and the animators can use the te they can use the config file to change these things. They don't need the like the animators or the, the the game designers don't need to know how to program in order to help like create the game like this. And if I change it down to one, you know, I'm not sure if there's gonna should be like a seizure warning here. But right? <laughs> like every frame the animation is being changed. And so that's that's not what you want. Skirt indeed. Mega Man go burr. All right. So that's, yeah, well, we'll get into the syntax of this later. Uh, okay. Go back to the PowerPoint. I want you to watch this video. I am not going to be watching YouTube videos on, on stream. I don't want to steal content like that. You know, that stuff is copyrighted and I don't want to take views and revenue away from them. But when I give you out these slides or right now you can, you can look at this lecture. Um, so link in the chat. Oh, come on. You can just Google this. Uh, hang on. Discard. I'll load it up, I guess. There we go. So here's the link in the chat. That's the video I want you to watch. And the video goes into details about how, for example, well, it's talking about keyframe animation. So keyframe animation has to deal with like, okay, we have one pose here and one pose here, right? And how Ideally, we'd want to have like really smooth movement and animation because real life is, you know, arbitrary. It has an infinite number of frames of animation. But it talks about how in video games, 
It's an important game design aspect how you choose your keyframes. And for things like Mega Man and Mario, sometimes just having two, three, four frames of animation for your character can actually be a really good thing for the game mechanics that you're trying to achieve. Because if you have a bunch of frames of animation in your jumping animation, it could actually make it feel like your, an your jumping is laggy or something like that. So that's what, that's what that video goes into and I really want you to watch it because for your final project, you're going to be going out and getting your own assets, okay? So whether you create them on your own or you borrow them from somewhere else, you are going to be doing them yourself. And you want to have that. This is not a game design course. It's a game programming course. But still, it's an important thing to, uh, to consider. And one more thing. Um, if I go here, I'm actually going to put this in the slide right now before I forget. There's another video here. I'll put it in the slide and I'll put it in the chat. Here's the other link. Okay. So you're watching me here edit the slides live. How old school graphics worked. And this is from the 8-bit guy and it's a great video. Why did that not come up as a link? There we go. Come on. PowerPoint. Work with me here. All right, so this is another video that I would like you to watch and it shows you how lucky you are to be working with SFML. And this is like how graphics worked um, in the Commodore 64, old computers and old video game systems like the NES. And there's a series of three videos on that. And no, we don't have an exam, but if you care about game programming and game design, then a little bit of this sort of history of how it used to work in comparison to how it works now is actually something that you should you should take in and savor, in, in my opinion. I love watching stuff like that. And both of these channels um, are really great if you're interested in learning about how video games work and how, um, how old school computing works. And as someone said in the chat, yes, or you can just make an NES game yourself. But that's a little bit out of the scope of this course. All right. That's it for me today. I know there was there's a lot of stuff coming, but for those of you who were who were saying at the beginning of the course that the course seemed to be moving a little slowly, well now we're jumping in, right? And an, another comment that I had before was someone said that you know the course is called Introduction to Game Design, and or sorry, Introduction to Game Programming. Well, this is like we're going a little bit beyond an introduction, but that's because it's a fourth year senior programming course, right? So I want to challenge you a little bit. And so next lecture will be on, uh, so we just did sprites, textures, and animations. Tuesday, there is no official lecture, but I may stream just because I like streaming. Um, maybe I'll do some programming or something during that time. And then on Thursday, we're going to learn about game events and systems and replays and how we can do all that sort of so cool stuff. The next one on the next, the following Tuesday will be where we explain assignment three and explaining assignment three is going to take the whole lecture. It's, it's a complex assignment. Um, and because of this, uh, assignment two, you now have five extra days to do it. So it was two weeks to complete. Now it's 19. And I suspect I'll actually be giving you more time for assignment three as well. So I may push back, um, assignment three's due date, maybe to like right here. Yeah, so maybe I'll take game tools and put it before assignment four. Let's actually do that right now. Why not? So let's take this. We'll paste it down here. We'll take this. So this is 11.05. This is a Thursday. This is lecture 16. And we're going to take this. And this is... A Tuesday and so Thursday to Tuesday is five days so now this 11 10 look at that so you now have three full weeks to work on assignment three 
and this is now assignment 17. But by giving you extra time to work on your assignment, um, you're having kind of less time to work on the project. But here's the good thing about the project in this course. When we get, so when assignment three is due and we start to uh, do assignment four, I'll actually start talking about the project. And the project is essentially going to need everything we've talked about in the course. Um, and the, the assignments, you can take the code from your assignments and copy and paste it into your project. So if you spend more time working on the assignments, then that's fine, right? Because all of that time and effort spent on the assignments is going to be able to be used in the project. And not only that, but the project, remember, is groups of up to four people. And so what we're going to have around this time is you'll submit a, a project idea document for your idea for the game. And, and I'll review that with the TAs and we'll say whether or not we think that's enough work or not enough work. Like we're not making World of Warcraft in this course, right? We're not using Unity. So there's, there are specifications that the final project has to have, but within those specifications, you can go as nuts as you want. I had a question here. What if I still can't get my assignment in by the due date? Well, you lose marks or you get a zero. Can we take the stuff you put into the assignments and put them into our projects? Yes. So anything that I give out for assignments is fair game for the project, right? Because we're, we're developing the game engine. And so for example, um, if you don't get assignment three done, then I basically give you a lot of assignment three as part of assignment four, right? Stuff like the animations class, I give that to you in assignment four. All right. So that's it for today. Thank you all for tuning in. Um, hope you're having as much fun as I'm having with the course. So, all right. And remember, no class on Tuesday, but please um, check to see if I'm streaming and come hang out if you're not doing anything at that time anyway. See you later.